my pleasure to welcome Roger Reef uh, here tonight. Um, probably uh, some of you have already seen uh, the exhibition upstairs, which uh, uh, shows some of the work of Riegler and Reef from uh, uh, Graz in uh, Austria. Though uh, from Graz, I think the work of uh, uh, Riegler and Reeve is quite uh, distinct and, and different from the majority of the, the projects that we now see, such as some of the ones that have been exhibited or shown more recently in the Architectural Review on the Galat School. Uh, Roger Reeve and uh, uh, Florian Riegler, they formed their practice in 1987, and since then they have been involved with a variety of uh, public projects. Um, uh, Roger was telling me that in fact it's very rare in Austria to have uh, private clients and that uh, um, all their projects are public and, and they won 80% of the projects in competition so that gives you something of this uh, sort of sense of how projects come about um, in, uh, in, uh, in Graz. Uh, there have been a number of social housing projects and then uh, the airport in Graz, the cultural center and the Center for Medical Aid, which is a project that they're currently uh, working on. Uh, Roger has been an external member of the Diploma Committee at the, at the university and a guest professor at the Berlager in 1994, and will be uh, taking up a visiting professorship at the Technical University in Prague uh, next year. Uh, the work of Riegler and Reeve uh, has been um, exhibited in a number of places including Vienna, Salzburg, Innsbruck, Linz and Stuttgart and was accompanied by uh, a wonderful uh, publication uh, on the work of uh, the office. We're very fortunate to have the exhibition upstairs and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Peter Allison for uh, organizing it and for uh, making it possible for us to have Roger here uh, tonight. Um, just one Last thing, I think that it, I really would sort of uh, impress on you to look at the work and especially the drawings upstairs very, very carefully because I think there is something very special in the way in which the practice has been <coughs> able to use, for example, mass-produced elements and redefine the whole sense of facade in ways that have a lot more to do with the redefinition and reorganization of things like windows, the nature of cladding, uh, and precisely that whole relationship between the appearance of buildings and the whole connection with mass production, I think, is something that is uh, uh, very special in the in the work of Riedler and Reeve. Anyway, without uh, further delay, would you join me in welcoming Roger Reeve? Can I have my lecture? <laughs> <laughs> I can take that as well. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for the um, introduction. And can we switch to this one more? Yeah. And uh, usually we hold these uh, lectures both of us, so next to me usually the Florian Riegler, and, but he cannot be here this evening because he's in a jury in Salzburg, so we split up and we were two days ago in, in Berlin to give a lecture, and uh, that's why it's only me left here in, in uh, London, but still I like to come and I would like to show a few projects we made and just not try to expa uh, explain the projects uh, we made, but uh, try to explain why they are made in that way. Um, on the poster you could see there's a title actually for this lecture and it's called The Conditioned Openness and uh, we gave lectures the uh, last two years on, on this title, uh, under this title already, uh, mainly talking on the um, developing of ground plans and now we're actually continuing um, this Conditioned Openness thing issue, uh, calling it Conditioned Openness 2 and I would like to talk a little bit about the materiality uh, we use and in certain buildings because now we're fortunate enough to having built quite a number of buildings already as a young, rather young practice. We're not that young actually anymore. 
And uh, so I can show a few of those buildings which have been built and a few which we are planning at the moment, but you can actually know or realize what uh, or how they will appear or be like in, in future when they're built. Can I have the first slides, please? <coughs> Oh, sorry, I have to do that now. Okay. Um, the question of materiality, why, uh, why are things being made in um, glass and steel? Or, do I continue here? It doesn't work here. Does it work on the other side? Can I have the next two slides, please? Um, why are things made, buildings made in brick? plaster, asbestos, even plastic, steel on the left side. And the next two slides. Uh, no, that one's wrong. Uh, why are things made in concrete, steel, and other materials? Um, the exploration of the supporting and unsupporting elements, which is actually important in this issue, uh, necessarily leads to the question of materiality in respect of especially the non-supporting parts. So we talk of buildings in which material, of which material they are made, we actually talk about the facades because it's more or less clear what the um, low bearing structure of a building usually um, is. <coughs> so when talking about this, the facades or say the, the um, non-supporting parts of a building, uh, we must notice that we're actually free to choose these materials, which materials we want to have and what we want to show with them. So there's something behind it and I would say there's something we, we calculate with and it's the effect we want to have the building to be or the, to show uh, with the choice um, of the materials. <coughs> the choice of material supports and articulates the design concept actually and the relation of uh, content established between the surface and the project. The surface and the concept cannot really be considered in separation. Those nature may vary widely from the urban approach to a development of the ground plan. The concept is always based on an attitude, the taking of a position in a socio-political context which finds its visual expression actually in the creation of a building. And this is an explanation, explanation for us actually why um, certain architects of different times uh, come to more or less the same results. And this is also an explanation for us why many, the buildings we do just about always look different. They never look alike. May I have the next two slides, please? I'd like to start off with an example by German architect who died recently, a few months ago, Heinz Bienefeld, born 1926, an architect who worked in the Rhineland near Cologne, uh, actually only making private houses and churches. This is his own private house, renovation and refurbishment of an old um, farmhouse. Um, Heinz Bienefeld used bricks to a far extent for building, and he wasn't actually pleased with the bricks you can buy in Germany, so the bricks he used were his own production with a special measurement. And not only that, he also actually widened the joints, the, the, the layer joints between the bricks to two centimeters just to s build up and to give another image of the surface uh, of a brick wall, which is not only the, um, the addition of its components of only having bricks as a fair-faced facade. And the same thing he actually did uh, does in interior which you see on the left side there which is the, um, the living room of this house uh, which is behind that on the right hand side uh, where he actually use, makes these whitewashed um, plastered walls with a rough bag plaster um, using um, marble po uh, powder in, in the paint actually to give the, um, the surface more depth which is something very stunning when you see how the daylight or the sunshine uh, goes on the facade and how it reacts and the um, effect it has on it. <coughs> the next two, please. Another example I would like to show you is the um, 
Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, which, is, which was built in the 50s as a kind of um, post-Bauhaus uh, institution and designed by Max Bill, a uh, Swiss artist and uh, architect. And the thing which is very interesting in this building is that it's made mainly made of concrete and the load-bearing and non-load-bearing elements are all in one surface all of a sudden, and that is very important. If you, next two, please. Um, try to read this building. These are the, the, the student apartments. That the surface becomes something completely different. Also, the windows are in the same surface as the um, outer facade. <coughs> the next two. Slides, please. I'll just go through a few materials and show you examples uh, which are also always very interesting to us. This is the um, Alte uh, Pinakothek in Munich, uh, which was actually the first um, building built as a museum by Klenze in a classicist uh, style and um, renovated after the war by Dolgast, which is actually the important part here. Uh, it was damaged by bombs during the war and uh, Dolgas actually used the same bricks um, which Klemse used already, uh, taking them from, an, uh, from army barracks, destroyed army barracks nearby the Türkenkaserne, uh, actually showing where this damage uh, was done to the building and appearing it, uh, letting it appear as, as a non-finished building on the outer part, but using actually the same material just in a different way. The next two, please. And in the um, interior, he did slight changes actually to the plan of the building. And uh, there was a staircase first on the uh, right-hand side, and the entrance wasn't in the middle as it is now. So what Dolgas did, he in inserted a new staircase, as you see it in the plan on the right-hand side. Uh, staircases going up on to both sides, changing the whole museum actually uh, completely. and trying to support this new spatial concept um, and the concept of utilization in the building by um, plastering or bagging the, the brick walls inside to make it a new, uh, appear a new unity inside this existing building. It's a very stunning impression if you go inside that building nowadays. It's just been renovated again at the moment. <coughs> and can I have the next two, please? This is probably a building every one of you knows, the Eames House, and after the renovation. And um, we like showing actually this example because um, there's some certain relation, say, to a Mondrian painting here, and you've got the um, structural elements, the supporting and the non-supporting elements, still uh, in this facade, and but also enhancing them by painting the um, supporting elements black and the others are colored, uh, either white or red, or filled in with glass. But still these elements, as with the um, Neue Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, are all in one surface, and I think it's quite stunning to, especially if you see in the context of, uh, could I have the next two slides, please, uh, that the building actually should have looked completely different before this was the first design they made. Uh, as a kind of cantilever building, we still have the uh, difference between the, the articulated difference actually between the supporting and the um, non-supporting elements. <coughs> so I assume that this topic must have been of interest to them as well, uh, because when reading the things about the Eames House, it's, it's never really stated why uh, they changed it, except for the one explanation that they saw. Um, a building of Mies van der Rohe before also as this cantilever type and the cantilever type house had become quite en vogue to that time. <coughs> the next two, please. <coughs> um, when using reinforced concrete, it's something very special because especially reinforced concrete you can use as a supporting and non-supporting element um, in the same building and you kind of uh, can make use of the method of uh, irritating um, the, the observer, uh, not really showing which part uh, is load-bearing and which is 
uh, not load bearing. <coughs> and we actually always, in, in our projects, try uh, to work with this method of confusion uh, of the statical uh, functions as we did with this uh, housing scheme here on the left side, which is the um, low-cost housing scheme in graz Straßgang. <coughs> the next two, please. <coughs> This, as I said, is a low-cost housing scheme, and low-cost is actually in, in our region uh, no topic at all because until recently there was a lot of money for social housing, and it's actually quite has been become quite expensive. So our building prices in in Graz are as high as in Switzerland and far higher than than in Germany, although the um, <coughs> average wages are far less than than in Germany. Um, we try to differentiate here between the um, load-bearing, non-load-bearing elements by having the load-bearing parts inside uh, the building and on the outside the whole facade is uh, made up of these prefabricated elements. <coughs> this was possible, this method was actually possible because we've got an, uh, a, a program for this housing scheme which is rather similar, an addition of same units, more or less same units, the only two different uh, apartments in the scheme. There's one of about 70 square meters and one of 50 square meters, which actually made it possible to think about prefabricated elements in a very reduced way, because usually nowadays the industry can make any kind of prefabricated element. It cannot be difficult enough, but we try to make very simple uh, things, and <coughs> only very few different elements were used here of different size. <coughs> The next two, please. <coughs> Sorry. And when making use of these, um, the addition of these modular elements, uh, one has to pay quite a lot of attention on how the whole thing will appear. So it's not only the um, thing of having same elements uh, on the facade, but we actually, in our plan on the right hand side, uh, thought of the idea of putting these um, sunscreens in front, sliding sunscreens, which are um, three meters high, and which gives a layering um, to the facade, which uh, is actually very important because if the facade would have stayed as it is on the left side, um, perhaps still adding some windows to it, uh, it would probably look like many examples you know already are very bad um, architecture, so it's very dangerous actually moving in this area where you can say if not everything is built, it can suddenly appear to be terrible or awful. <coughs> actually here for this project we wanted to have a, a collaborator, a, girl who, a lady who applied from Eastern Germany and we showed her the project and she never came back to the office because she only remembered building things like that as it is on the left side and didn't really notice that you can do it as it is on the right side. The next two please. So this is then the, the actual uh, facade on the west side, the west facade, uh, with um, sliding elements of nylon material, which gives a very nice uh, light inside, and uh, the public space in front of the building. Uh, behind you see the existing buildings in that region already, and it is always very important for us when we uh, set up a new building, we say it's, it shouldn't be like uh, having any losers in the in the vicinity because otherwise they probably feel quite awful. So we try to kind of match up with the buildings existing there already, just showing up very slight uh, dis, uh, differences which you only notice probably uh, at the second sight. <coughs> the next two, please. Uh, the other facade, the east facade, is different. You, we used here. Um, metal, stretch metal, galvanized stretch metal for uh, the um, sunscreens uh, due also to fire protective reasons because we've got the staircases um, on this side and we couldn't use this material um, here. Um, as you notice, these apartments, they don't have any um, balconies or bay windows or whatever is typical for housing or which makes housing uh, nice nowadays. 
um, it was our concept actually to um, reduce the, the private areas around the building uh, to a great extent so that everybody actually can uh, take a share of the public area which we produced and then they also have to uh, try to get hold of this area because we don't show them what to do. We only can imagine what they can do but we don't tell them uh, what they are to do. <coughs> So the whole building and the whole uh, site is changing um, all the time. The next two, please. <coughs> so what we actually do in our housing schemes is um, we force the owner or the tenant uh, to participate actually in the program, although on a um, political basis <coughs> the uh, later owners and tenants have to actually uh, participate in the planning process, which we don't appreciate uh, that much. So these are uh, rent apartments for rent, and they didn't have to actually <laughs> participate in the um, planning process. So this is actually uh, a glance on the facade, as you would never see it. It's just for the photographer. So uh, this whole thing changes day and night, and so you notice when people are in there, and it becomes actually uh, filled with, with life the, <laughs> the moment the people... Um, move in. The space on the right hand side, uh, the ground there and, and the shrubs in between, it's green now and the shrubs will grow about three to four meters high and very dense and they all blossom white at the same time. And after a while, about ten years time, they have to cut down the shrubs again because probably the base, the apartments at the ground floor level will be um, too dark. The next two please. And uh, the moment you more or less subversively force the tenants or the owners to make use of um, the structure and of the building you set up and the site the way you made it, um, this leads actually to a kind of identification with the project, which is very important. But I th we don't think that if somebody likes something immediately at the first glance that you will uh, like it in a few weeks or a few years later. Which is more important is that the building and the site doesn't deteriorate after a while. So this identification with the project itself is actually um, very important. And it seems to work until now. <coughs> the next two. <coughs> the, um, the only problem we actually have at the moment is uh, the considerable amount of architectural tourists running around that area, so the people in the ground floor apartments are actually quite aggravated already. Uh, the architects are always moving these sunscreens and the people are behind still in bed or having breakfast or, or whatever. So if you would go there, please uh, keep a distance, at least a little bit. Next two. <coughs> what we actually said, the, the late owners, uh, to be able to do or to participate in the planning process was they could uh, select the um, surface material of the interior uh, of the apartments. And so we fixed the standard and they could actually either accept the standard or have more or less or whatever. And we actually tried to present an apartment where you can use it, which you can use in different ways. And uh, of course, you've always got the bathroom and you've got the kitchen and you've got the bedroom and the living room. But we actually only said where the bathroom and the kitchen is and we didn't actually say where there's a bedroom and where there's a living room or dining room or whatever. So, with other words, <coughs> we tried to reduce the um, determined areas in the apartment uh, to a far extent. So the undetermined elements, parts, surfaces in the apartment as uh, the living area, whatever happens in the living area. Uh, can be very big. So we actually designed apartments which you can use in completely different ways and in this participation phase uh, they could actually say if they wanted all, this, all these doors as you see it on uh, the slides here, uh, the sliding doors um, alongside the facade and the high doors up to the ceiling which, go, which uh, make um, uh, the utilization possible uh, crosswise in the apartment. The next two, please. <coughs> so this is part 
part of the scheme on the left hand side uh, on the plan. Uh, the thing which was very important for us in um, this um, building is uh, having, having to make a four room department which <coughs> we introduced a four, <coughs> sorry, a four and a half room apartment and the two room apartment, the two and a half room apartment. So we actually added this half, uh, half room which is a very small space just opposite um, is there something for pointing, or is it for the television? Mm -hmm. hmm? Wait. Yeah. Um, which is actually this this room over here, which is opposite the entrance, and this is the small apartment of 50 square meters. That's one of 70 square meters, and you've got the same small room over here. <coughs> this enables the user actually to to use the space as as it is here, as a big, say, living room. You also can use it as a small children's room, as a studio, as an atelier, uh, as an enlargement of the entrance area. And the same is actually also possible with this area here. You can either have your living or dining area here or down there or have it as, as a bedroom over there and then you've got the living area here and you've got probably the bedrooms over there. So the decisive element actually is if, if the people who move in there have kids or young kids, they don't have to move out and buy a new apartment or look for a new apartment. They can stay in there for several years and then uh, look for something else. This is, of course, um, as I'm going to show, other projects we built already. Um, it appears to be very simple to, to build, but um, it was actually rejected three times by the local government, and we were not able to build it at all because the local government um, stated that if we would build apartments in that way, um, as as you have it over here, the Sturian family structure will be endangered. <coughs> so they actually forced us to change the, uh, the apartments to a more conventional one, uh, which we show here on this one. So the small room suddenly becomes a kitchen. So, and then you can't do anything in this apartment anymore. So you've got the dining or living room here and the bedroom here. And the same uh, over here with the large apartment. It becomes very, very conventional by only making the small change of taking the kitchen from here to that small room there, but we made this kind of agreement that 50% of the apartments were, as you see them on the right hand side, unconventional, and uh, the other 50% are conventional. The next two, please. <coughs> this um, open uh, plan, or very open plan, as we try to introduce it in this housing scheme, is actually also something very similar uh, on an uh, urban uh, basis, <coughs> as you see it in this project here for the Technical University um, in Graz, the extension of the tex Technical University, uh, housing the um, um, computing and electronic departments uh, of the university. <coughs> the existing or part of the existing university is, is down there. These are existing buildings already which is about uh, two and a half or three kilometers from the city <laughs> center where the old university is. Uh, what we try to do here is um, to kind of open up this um, very campus-like situation here to make it more, more public so everybody can go, go through this area here with very small, only um, three, four high, uh, three story high buildings. Uh, which are also very narrow, kind of trying to build something like a um, small town character. The characters of a small town are in there with um, small passageways, with walkways, with bridges, with um, uh, squares in the middle of um, different character. The next two, please. <coughs> so you've got the buildings here when shown in another model. We'll begin construction uh, next year and we've got these squares in in between here so you can actually walk through the whole um, building or campus situation and uh, so that these squares become diff have a different character they're always planted with will be planted with different kinds of trees which is um, probably very good for uh, these very technical students that they've perhaps noticed there are different kinds of trees and they're find the way around in this um, building complex. Um, the next two, please. Um, the uh, 
building itself will be will have an, uh, a concrete facade, and I'll refer to that later. And uh, we actually want to show that you can read a building as as you saw the model just now, uh, or the whole complex as say 16 buildings. You also can read it as eight buildings at the same time. It depends on what you focus on. So it's very important of what the interior and what the exterior spaces and uh, spaces will be like, and we want to have them to be quite alike, actually. So we've got the, the image of the um, exterior space on the left side and of the interior space on the right-hand side, with a slight difference only that there's a, a roof with skylights on top, but the surface, the treatment of the surface will be more or less the same as on the outside. Also, the treatment of the um, ground itself um, should be uh, more or less the same. We don't know yet how it will work, but we have to think about that because we've still got a few months' time uh, to solve that problem. The next two, please. <coughs> so there's a plan of, of this uh, whole situation, and, and the buildings are more or less um, organized in, in the same way uh, with staircases here as um, the fire protection uh, regulations are uh, needed. I don't know, 25 meters or something. And so we've got an orthogonal grid running through this building uh, like that. And you can still walk through the building, as I showed you before, in that direction over there. Um, the length of the, the building was actually defined by the institute at the top floor here, saying it is that long. And the institutes below, they're all not of the same size, uh, were fitted in. And then we left these big holes here we don't, where we don't need any, any buildings. So we've only got these holes on the ground floor level and the upper, first upper floor. <coughs> the um, spaces for uh, professors' assistants, the offices are, on, are always on this side over here. As you see, the smaller rooms here. And the seminar rooms, teaching rooms, libraries, and so on are on that side, connected um, by, by bridges um, inside the building and also outside the buildings itself are connected by bridges. So this is always one uh, institute, uh, as you see it here, or there's an institute on two floors, but there's never, there are never two, two um, institutes um, on one floor. <coughs> the next two, please. Um, as you saw just now, the, the buildings are actually very um, slim, and they're only six meters wide. So there's six meters, and then there's the gap between, and another six meters of a building. And what we try to show here is that we want to express the, the volume of the buildings, as I said before, trying to make it be read in as 16 buildings or as, as eight buildings. And so the um, facade we chose here to, to be built is of in situ concrete of colored um, slightly colored concrete, and trying to show that this facade is actually um, non-load bearing. So the columns of the for structural columns you see behind here, and they run behind the facade at about 30 centimeters distant to, to that facade. And here you see the program of this university is completely different to the program of the housing scheme where we had the same apartments, uh, road or in addition, adding um, being added on every floor and uh, and so on. And here the, the program of every institute is different, so you can read that in the facade as well. And the facade itself becomes a very um, independent element, kind of a, a three-dimensional um, skin being pulled over the whole building. The next two, please. <coughs> Whereas the, the facade at the airport in Graz, which we um, realized, which was built last, no, one and a half years ago, uh, is actually even more an independent element as the facades of the uh, university. Um, Graz has a very small airport, no mistake about that. It's just for 700,000 passengers per year, which is a regional airport with um, international destinations, quite important, and there was a competition for, <coughs> for the extension and renewal of the existing airport. And we tried to actually... Um, build or to visualize the concept of what an airport um, ought to be and the size of this airport was actually quite favorable to be able to do this. So on the one hand, the airport is to us something like an entrance to the town 
as a, as a new um, town gate and we try to interpret uh, this topic or this issue here in the airport. So we <coughs> built up this very um, independent facade with um, in layering the word of Graz, where you see the G on the left side, the word of Graz in the facade. And uh, the situation is following in the Graz that the runway, there's only one runway, is parallel to this building. And from the distance, you can see uh, this lettering. You can read the word Graz <coughs> and you know where you've landed. And the closer you get to the facade, the more it actually dissolves. You go through the facade and you're actually um, in the town or you should be in the town, there are farms, and then you get to the town. But still, that's the first moment you actually have contact uh, with the town. The next two, please. <coughs> so that's why the other facade, the land side <coughs> facade, is completely different to the air side facade. Uh, here we tried actually to um, reduce the, the factor of stress you have, or most people have when, when flying and getting nervous before, and so we said to, to reduce this, we should at least show a lot, and so everybody can see what is happening in the building, if there's a big crowd or the queues are long, and then they have to hurry up or not. So there's a pure glass facade um, on this side, and you can look right into the building up to the check-in counters, and you can see how many people are there already. Uh, a concept actually which uh, worked very well, more or less actually too well, because um, what we never thought of, that people are that nervous when they come by taxi in the morning and the building is actually quite uh, well lit. Uh, they don't even notice they're not in the building yet and they just barge into the glass facade. So we're to do some adjustments to, to this facade and now it's working actually quite well already. <coughs> Next two. Another point of um, trying to visualize a concept of the airport was that f um, for us the, um, the airport is actually the, the site where you change um, the means of transport, where you leave the car, you get into the plane and vice versa. And that's all. There's nothing more actually to an airport. <coughs> and this we try to show here. And the thing you need for, for this site of, of changing the, the means of transport is you need a roof as, as, a <coughs> as a protective means for against rain and snow. So we just made one big roof. That's the old airport actually consists of one big roof and one facade on the air side. So there's this big roof with a lot of skylights to have a kind of daylight atmosphere um, in the building. So you don't actually notice if you're inside or on the, in, on the outside. And it also makes, tries to make the, um, we try to make the building appear to be a very small small building uh, appear to be big and all the installations in this um, public area in the airport are only two meters seventy is high so they don't reach to the facade so you can always see there's something still behind or there's the um, exterior the outside part already as you see it on the right hand side over there. What we also try to do is to reduce the amount of signs at the airport because people kind of are stupefied nowadays already just following signs in airports, following the A's or the B's or the C's or, or whatever, the ones and twos. And this airport is of a size where we could, we could reduce it. And at the same time, we'll say that we don't want to invent or redesign these, um, these codes and we can make use of the existing codes because you got used to them. So we managed to reduce these, these codes and these signs uh, in a considerable amount. And uh, also there we actually had to add a few later again because the people didn't find the A's and the B's anymore. The next two. <coughs> so all elements like um, the, the static uh, structure um, of this airport or the technical parts of it, of um, heating and uh, air conditioning are, in our opinion, not very important or not important at all. So we don't show any beams in this airport. You don't see any ventilation ducts of any kind here because we just wanted to show <coughs> the, the thing of the roof and the facade. So only in a, in a grid of about 12 meters apart, you've got these very slim uh, concrete columns where you might notice there must be b uh, big beams in the uh, roof above which have a span of about 
um, 18 meters and a cantilever of 9 meters in front in the roof, which you see on the right-hand side. <coughs> All these elements, if you should, you would like to show them, or if you show them, the, the beams and the technical appliances actually um, reduce the, the strength of the concept um, of a building, and we don't think it is necessary to show these things um, nowadays anymore. The next two, please. <coughs> Oops, it's actually in one line. Um, as I said before, it's actually in an extension of an existing airport, although you don't really see a lot of the existing or of the old airport anymore. It was actually in the middle part between the left side, there's the um, restaurant above, and on the right side, uh, the administration, which we extended as well. Next two, please. <coughs> Where um, we've got the, the administration part on, on the left side here. Um, we added actually two new um, buildings and set them very close to each other, and this was only possible by introducing a new kind of um, glass, which was made by an Austrian firm called Eckelt, who also worked with uh, Forster uh, since a long time already. And we actually needed a lot of, we wanted to have a lot of daylight in these rooms, and at the same time, uh, daylight is a problem for um, when working on computers, uh, as everybody knows. So we developed this facade, and it took quite a long time. And we know that one can actually make a facade of this kind uh, in this dimension, in this proportion as it is here. It's a two-story building and about 40 meters long. If it would be bigger, it might become a problem because you read the facade different and it uh, wouldn't be that good of that quality anymore as it um, is here. Uh, what we used here is the facade, it's a kind of insulation glass uh, with krypton in it, and which has got a very high insulation value, so we could have a pure glass facade um, in the uh, administration building, whereas our um, regulations in Austria say that you are only allowed to have a maximum of 30% glass in a facade, which is not very much, and the minimum is 10%, so the span you can actually work with is very, very small and we managed to convince the um, official people here by uh, using 100% or making use of 100% glass facades, which are nearly as good as normal um, facades. They use, say, brick and plaster and all these um, traditional elements. <coughs> but still the very decisive thing here is actually the scale in which you use this, and that's also something which is important for us in the uh, next project I would like to show you the next two slides, please. Um, this is the, the project, <coughs> project for the um, medical um, aids uh, in Graz, so it's only the, the dental department of the medical aid in Graz. Uh, a quite big building, the size of the airport as well, and it's right in the middle of the old part um, of the town. Graz is actually as a short explanation, a town of about 350,000 inhabitants, or 200,000 and, and 40,000 students, and uh, 290,000 and, and 40,000 students, and um, a big old um, protected um, part, non-destroyed part uh, in the center, and where most buildings, or 90% of the buildings, are listed. So it's very difficult to build in this area, in the center of Graz. Most buildings nowadays you, <coughs> you see in, in publications are uh, in the suburbs or in the province of um, Styria. <coughs> the site is a very small site right in the middle of the town, and so we actually had to make use of the whole site and build as high as possible and as wide as possible and usually that brings quite a lot of problems for, for a building which is 20 meters wide. So what we did here is um, to design this, this 20 meter wide building, but at the same time cut big kind of atriums into the building to let sunlight um, get right deep into the building. As you see it in this section here, you've got these kind of terraces or atriums and the sunlight can go right down there, which we've got slots over there so it can fall down to the first floor or second floor in the building. So it's actually a building which wraps around, goes around these um, atriums 
and um, big terraces. And this whole facade is made of um, glass, which I will explain um, shortly. Next year, please. <coughs> so when walking around this building, you've got the staircases there, you've always got some contact with daylight when, when going around here. Uh, there you've got this atrium cut deeply into the building. You always can go out here or you can look outside there. So you've never got any dark areas and all the uh, office walls inside uh, the building are only about two meters, will be two meters high. This building will be going under construction next year. Uh, here, of course, we've got this uh, similar um, problem as we had at the airport that the, you're only allowed to have 30% uh, um, glass in a facade. And uh, we said, well, you can have 30%, you can also have 50% if you use a better kind of glass, say, for instance, it's Krypton. So there, 50% of this facade is, is of glass, and 50% are closed, uh, highly insulated um, elements here distributed across the whole building. And if you have a closer look on that side there, we're trying to make a, a very thick three-dimensional facade, which is on the southern side here, uh, 75 centimeters thick, and on the northern side it's only 25 centimeters. So you can walk through uh, this facade here. <coughs> there are several different concepts nowadays um, being built of double or three-dimensional facades. And we actually chose the, um, this facade to be that wide or that deep because uh, due to cost and expenses and because you've got a 20, <coughs> sorry, 20 centimeter <coughs> thick facade, you have to have the old facade to be open on the inside, which is very complicated and very expensive. So we said we can make, we'll make a facade where you can walk around inside for reasons of maintenance. And so you only have to have one one or two doors in the facade from, from the inside to be able to walk around. So there are bridges in this facade where you can walk around. In the facade, there's the, the sun protecting elements as well. <coughs> and the facade will be used energetically as well. <coughs> Something which is very interesting at the moment, but not really interesting enough because energy itself is far too cheap as it would be a topic for, for a client nowadays. But somehow we managed to convince this client that you can build a far more expensive facade because it will be cheaper in 10 years' time due to um, savings in the um, maintenance. The next two, please. <coughs> the um, parts where you can actually look out of the building are these windows which you can open and you've got uh, natural ventilation in, in the building or in the, in the offices themselves, so there's no air conditioning um, inside. <coughs> these other parts here are translucent, these, these light green parts, uh, made of a cast <coughs> glass, a very rough glass on the outside, and a very traditional, more or less not a really traditional glass facade um, on the inside. And this cast glass also covers these closed areas over here, so um, there will be one whole pure glass facade covering um, the whole building. And here again we try to work with a means of um, irritation because when seeing this building, um, when it is built, uh, you actually wouldn't imagine that there's a um, dental department or medical aid department inside. So you have to read the building in a different way and the moment you try, you're actually forced to, to um, notice the building and try to know what is inside, uh, the bu building itself becomes um, very independent in itself. And this independence, not only for, for the facade, but also for the building is quite important um, to give a, a building a kind of self-confidence and being part, part of a town and not being actually uh, trying to be something very harmonic in, in the setting of a town because we don't believe in that we say we have to go the different way and to have a very self-confident building so that it will be an accepted part um, of an old part of um, the town. <coughs> and also in this respect it is necessary to of course um, absor absorb um, 
surrounding elements, say elements as height and and so on, um, to make it be part part of the existing um, surrounding. Well, we didn't actually take notice of this. This very one aspect uh, of um, accepting the height is in the next project I would like to show you, the next two slides. <coughs> Uh, sorry, the two more next two then. <coughs> uh, for this project, also in Graz, a competition we won recently. Um, right in the centre of the old part again. Um, Graz is actually like like many many towns in in all over the world. It's got a river uh, going right through the town. It's got a small hill in the town, and it's got the the rich side and the poor side. And uh, so our project is here on on the poor side. It's over there. And the project I showed just now is over there, so it's not far away. And we didn't draw it there yet, so that's this one here. And it was a competition actually just to to draw or design a building on this uh, more or less um, new ugly square um, for a, that's for a private client and uh, without any program. And so we said the program actually should be in Graz because this river um, is quite low down. You don't really see it. There's no, the city actually doesn't take any notice of the river. It's on the left side here, and there's a lot of green around it, lots of shrubs, and, and you don't really see the other part of the town anymore because the, the trees are that high already. And there are only a few um, bridges leading across to the other part. We want to make a building which actually sets up a, context to the other part of the, of the town, which makes curious, which makes you nosy, which makes you go around there and see what is happening on the poor side uh, of Graz. <coughs> so we made this small um, high-rise building, and the site was very small. It was only um, 30 by 11 meters. Uh, actually, a very perverse situation, but I don't want to explain that here. Now, so a very small site, and we said there, there's a density of uh, given density in grass of 2.5, and we said that is not enough uh, on, on an urban level, and we need more. We made 3.5 and made an eight-story high house, which is actually forbidden uh, to be made in, in grass, although there are no regulations, but it's just about impossible to get a building permission for something uh, like that. Um, even It's even worse in the protected part of grass. But still we said it is important especially on the urban context, to have a building like that uh, with apartments at the top and <coughs> service departments at the top and uh, serviced offices um, between the first and the fourth floor in the building and a very open um, ground floor area. <coughs> so at the moment we're still trying to um, convince the municipality that, or the urban department in the municipality that they have to accept this building because we won the competition and the, um, everybody is actually in favor of building it, and we are quite sure that we'll be building it next year. The next two, please. <coughs> and here again, we try to make use of these means of uh, building something um, uh, very independent, something which will have self-confidence, something which irritates, actually. We don't know um, how high it really is. Okay, I said it's eight floors high, eight stories high. Uh, the ground floor you see on the left slide here is only two meter ten high, so it's very very uh, narrow, uh, small. And if you put persons next to it, the person is uh, people are just about as large as the ground floor on the left side. Just to be able to also enhance the, the height of the building, because it is just about impossible to build high buildings um, in Graz. And by uh, making use of these means of making an um, independent building, an independent building which can be made actually by a um, three-dimensional, at least three-dimensional facade, an irritating facade. Uh, we think we are able to contribute to making buildings which fit actually in a um, historical surrounding. Thank you.
Okay. Can we join you? Roger, we'll take some questions. Is there any any questions? They usually ask questions about the housing scheme. <laughs> Maybe well. Where for the um, medical <coughs> medical aid building? <coughs> well, there are different reasons actually for for this facade, and we don't know all the reasons nowadays and now anymore where, where it actually started. We just said it's we want to have a lot of daylight in this building, and the moment you want to have a lot of daylight, the building becomes quite warm at the same time. And um, so then you need some sun protection elements as well. It was the long facade in the southern facade. And uh, so we actually came to this um, three-dimensional facade because we can, we've got the warm air actually in the facade and it can be taken out of the facade and the building itself will stay cool. And in winter we've got, well, over the whole year we actually save about 40% of energy, which sounds a lot, but in shillings or pounds or whatever, it's just about nothing in the context of this whole building. <coughs> I have a sort of more general question, which is um, to do with the actual situation of working in, in parts. I know that obviously some of the things that a, a lot of people are familiar with is some, now this notion of the of the art school. And, uh, I think it would be very nice if, if you have some comments to make in terms of how you would, in a sense, situate your work in the context of of of, uh, of Graz and the way that uh, there are these these other architects who now tend to produce a different kind of architecture. I wonder how you see your work as a sort of critique of of the Graz school, if one can mm. call it that. Well, no, it's not actually a critic of, of the um, grad school because uh, we don't actually have that contact with the um, other architects. We know what's going on in town. So, as I said just now, it's a very small town, but there are about 150 practices in town. And of these 150, there are about 145 making grad school of architecture. So, so there's a very strong stream there. And uh, no, we actually work on. on on different topics. I don't know if the grad school of architecture works on a topic at all, just actually their, their ideas of being, you know, Graz is, is a very provincial town and everything happens in Vienna, so as a kind of, um, you know, actually a psychological, as a psychological reason, the, the grad school of architecture actually came up just to show we are different, we are something else than, in, than the Viennese architects who are very uh, traditional and but very good, partly very good actually. So they just tried to make something different. I think that was the main, main motive, um, trying to change things. And due to um, very favorable political uh, reasons and a very favorable political situation in Graz, they were able to um, not only design these projects but build them as well. And everybody is actually bewildered that you can do things like that nowadays, although it's not possible to do it that easy anymore at, right at the very moment. And so our context is actually with Graz that we've only got our office in, in that town. But the, our context to say Vienna and Switzerland is far stronger than to any other architect in the city of, of Graz. Especially say, of course there's always a family, you, you work somewhere, you've got a family always. Uh, the German Swiss architects, if it's um, say, Marcel Miley and Marcus Peto or Peter Merkley and Viennese architects like uh, Krishanitz and uh, Michael Odon and so on, who work on a very um, similar basis and actually follow this more or less very similar um, ideas. But you don't feel that the the work somehow has an implicit criticism of, of if, you, if you might call it a sort of organicism that might be more apparent in, in the grass school? 
you, you think that this is uh, I don't know if it's 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 real. You know, it's, it's the, the the role of playing the opposition to Vienna is most important for Brandt's architects, and that's something very provincial for us. And we say we've got no problem with Viennese architects, and we know each other. And, but it's something very p specific in in Austria that if if you go to 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 Vienna, which is only two hours by car, um, everybody of course asks you what what are you doing in Vienna because nobody really would say that. He goes to Vienna because they don't like the town and they know everything is just <coughs> bad bad in this big, big town, which, which is typical provincial. And, and so we can't actually follow this idea. We, it's something completely different. And of course, we are treated in this sense as, as accepted outlaws in, in this town. And due to the fact that there were a lot of competitions, we were able to build things. And now things are changing a little bit. But, and perhaps there's not enough work in, in future in, in the city of Rad, So have to find work somewhere else, if it's, it's in Vienna or Holland or wherever. No, not really. So we try to work simultaneously all the time, which is quite a luxury. And uh, but that's why we set up the office as two of us. And when we start working on the project, we actually wait till everybody or the two of us have got time, enough time to develop the project, and we start up with one piece of paper where we where we start scribbling on at the same time and talking about the project and knowing what the project will be like, and then continuing uh, working on the projects. Although the other collaborators are as well, but we always informed what is happening and actually go to every meeting more or less, the two of us. So it's actually a stronger position you have at that moment, trying to actually implement the architecture you want to do. <coughs> if there are no more questions, I'd just like to thank Roger. And we uh, are going to go upstairs to uh, to the front member's room where the exhibition is, and I'm sure that uh, Roger would be happy to take some questions of a more personal nature up there. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.